really get down to that bare metal of like, do you have a product worth partnering? With? Do you have a strategy worth partnering with? Do you have a team worth partnering with? Here's our go-to-market team. Then it's like, and there's a partner team and there's a community team. It's like, but if you start with it yourself and you as the founding team are figuring it out, it will be baked into your strategy, your culture, your ethos from day one. Welcome to Make Them Famous, the podcast about partner enablement. The only podcast to uncover both how partner teams enable their partners and how other department leaders enable their partner teams to achieve success. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Make Them Famous, the podcast that brings you very close to the actual partnership execution effort by interviewing the teams that are doing it right now. In today's climate, account executives and partnerships teams need to collaborate more than ever to win big deals. I don't think anyone is going to argue with me there. Enter Mac Redden, CEO of Comsor, which is pivoting into sales enablement with the release of their product, Bronto. Mac has been outspoken and a contrarian, some would argue, this past year. Follow him on LinkedIn to to hear more of what he has to say on this topic and is joining me to share his views on partnerships, sales, and go-to-market. On today's episode, Mac and I discuss how we interpret my quote of the people are your partners as a strategy that teams should execute, why partner people talking to partner people about partnerships doesn't move the needle, how can partnerships people actually move the needle in their organization. We talk about community versus partnerships. We talk about the future of partnerships. We talk about what Mac is and would do differently with SaaS go to market for the next two years. We talk about the honest truth about partnerships as a team and a process. And we end on some advice and some do's and don'ts of co-selling. It gets particularly interesting around minute 20. Enjoy what about this episode you'd like to enjoy, but you'll be happy you hung on to the end like all these episodes. And as usual, we do have sponsors for the show to make this thing possible for you. So please take a listen, enjoy, and we'll see you there. So let's talk about two tools that you can use to effectively manage and draw revenue from partner operations for free if you choose. I'm showing here, this is the free reveal.co account, not reveal.com, reveal.co. You can log into your reveal.co account, connect your data sources and start mapping accounts with partners again for free, which is wonderful. You want to drive business from partnerships. That's why we're all here. That's what we want to do. But it is very difficult to do a couple of things that you want to do with a partner. One of those things is getting referrals out of partnerships. Most partnerships never have a continual process of referral sending and receiving. Most partnerships are stale up to sometimes 90 plus percent of your program's partners are stale. But products like Reveal allow us to dive into that data and say, where are we at? Who do you have that we also have in each stage of the pipeline? And let's create a system that pushes these deals further down our pipeline together. And one thing that's important about mapping accounts versus co-selling is you can map accounts to start the source of attribution between you and a new partner. I like to say you want to co-sell, but oftentimes the partnership won't get there, right? But that doesn't mean that you don't need to see here is where we at where we are at as a partnership today, meaning we have 10 shared customers, the middle of the Venn diagram, if you are visualizing this, and I want to get to 20. Let's go do partner marketing. Let's go do some co-selling. Let's go create some additional pie together. And let's look back at this middle of the Venn diagram in a month and see if we have 12 or 15 or 20 and see if this stuff that we're doing together is actually working. That's reveal, reveal reveal.co. Go and create your free account today. Second thing you're going to need is a resource, a tool, a place to say, here is where we are doing partnerships and here's what's going on with our ecosystem. It's called Partner Hub. And again, it does have a free account. If you're a tech user listening, reach out to an agency like this one here that's a partner of yours to send you a request through their partners area. We are at a point right now with Partner Hub where we have too many 
applications to get in. And because it's an ecosystem, it is a marketplace. It is where everyone meets and we actually suggest partners. We cannot just let the floodgates open and have a bunch of competing technology software in the marketplace. But if you are invited by your agency partner, you can jump right in. They just have to click the ad button. Why would you get in Partner Hub? Let's talk about that. Like I mentioned, it is your central source of truth for what partners are in what stages doing what activities now. It is also where you automate onboarding, where you trigger messages, where you push partners down a series of steps that they need to execute to get deeper in your program. Further, it is where you shop for partners that are also other users of Partner Hub. Further than that, it is where agencies, top digital agencies are who you would like to partner with. If you're a technology company, if you're an agency, you can find tech partners and digital agencies in here and you can reach out to them like this. Request partnership, they have your request, they will approve or deny. And then from there, you can create a task for the point of contact at this partner to book a call or you can just jump into their calendar. You can assign an account manager. You can trigger automations by stage, by project, by type, and you can add them to your custom directory. So you can showcase them on a subdomain of your choice. This one here has a lead capture form. So you can generate leads for your program and leads for your partners. All of my partners are automatically shown and I can turn them on and off by enabling or disabling them from the partner directory. It is all managed in one place. Further, you have a broadcast system where you can activate partners and bring them closer to your program. And then all the PRM features that you quote unquote need. And that's what we talk about on this podcast, how to effectively run partner operations and how the best teams on the planet are doing partnerships. And I think you'll really enjoy these two tools to get the most out of your partners and maintain the best partner program that you can. So check out partnerhub.app. And then there's a few links to book demos. There's a few links to watch some videos and see how the product works. And uh, we know you're going to love it. So jump in and we'll see you inside. So this is our first podcast. So I'm excited. So Mac, um, introduce yourself. Who are you? What do you do? Why dinosaurs? All that fun stuff. Why dinosaurs? Always always have to have them in frame, right? It's, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Mac. I'm the, the founder and CEO of, of Comsor, which is deeply tied to why dinosaurs. Um, and I am building, uh, I guess, two products at Comsor. Uh, Bronto and Matcha, so Dino and Tea Theme. Those are like talk about your, you know, the founder's personality showing up in, in the day to day business. And uh, both products we're building are for exploring this uh, this idea of go to network instead of go to market. And I'm sure we'll we'll talk a lot about that in this conversation. But uh, yeah, that's the short version. Killer, yeah. And I I met you uh, somewhere around I think 2019. One of yeah, super early. Yeah, super early. You're building uh, the Comsor product, um, a community uh, logistics or community, sorry, um, um, reporting, activation, all that fun stuff. And uh, you you kind of learned along that road, uh, like a lot of us learning uh, learning when we're building products that um, it may not be the may 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 not have the longest legs. I, I would say when you're going into that um, team and trying to build product for that type of an organization or that type of a, a, a use case. Um, so a slight pivot in there. And uh, I've been in your beta and the new product is is fantastic. Um, on the right track. And as we have conversations, you say something that I'm just like, yes, that is, that is it. That is, that is it. And, uh, you know, it's some of the stuff is super contrarian, like your LinkedIn posts about how SDRs or cold calling is just not working and there's there's uh, there's a way around it. And you know there's a way around it. You're building product towards that. But I want to talk on this podcast about all this stuff, about what's happening with partnerships versus community versus sales, um, where things are hitting walls, what to do about it, how individuals on partnership teams can really succeed these days and um, strategies and, and, and go to market and all that fun stuff. Um, so the first topic that we have today is, is understanding what a partnership is between two entities. So I'm going to start there. And the quote is, the people are your partners, uh, which is something that I believe strongly. And I just heard right before uh, we started recording that you believe this strongly as well. But how do you interpret partnerships is the question that I want to get out. 
I mean, there's always the simple version, but I think that's everyone can just put the dictionary definition of partnership. That's what everyone always touts. I think it kind of gets in the way. Um, I think partnerships are really like, I think there's a lot more unique stuff that can come out of partnerships than most people do. Everyone always talks like partnerships, like co-selling, or it's like two companies getting together to like one plus one equals three. And it's like, yeah, sure. That's all surface level stuff. But I think there's a lot more interesting stuff when you get into like the actual, like, the actual like alignment of like seeing the way the world should be. And I think that's, you know, I, for me, a bit of a sort of sidebar, but like, I'm not a founder because I want to make money. I'm not a founder because I want to be famous. I'm a founder because I like building things and I have like a specific way I think the world should be. And I want to build for that way. And I think the most interesting partnerships come out of when two companies, two entities, two people, whatever it is, are aligned on that vision and that purpose. And then there's, of course, you can get into the details of like, how do you actually partner and what does that look like? But I think it, it starts with that. Okay. You said something that I thought was funny and thankfully I was on mute. So you didn't hear me laughing. But <laughs> one plus one equals three thing. And I get it. And I may have even said it in a post before myself, but it's, Oh, I've said it myself at times, <laughs> but it, it is one of those things where um, what I try to stress to the, our community is like, you, you can't, it can't be partner people talking to partner people about partnerships all day long. That doesn't move the needle. You really yeah. have to get out there and you really have to get involved in those other groups. So people always ask me about my stuff. I'm like, why, Alex, you're not really, you know, you're not really networking with partner people as much. You're kind of like deep involved in agencies and you're doing all this stuff with agencies and like, but you own a partnership platform. And it's like, how does that not make sense? You, Why aren't you doing that? Like, why aren't the partnership people sales people like you sales people do it i think better than partnership people but partnership people don't really network with the people that they should be partnering with as much as they network just with each other um so any thoughts on that and how can partner people today work to expand their network of potential partners this is going to be a, a probably a 10 minute discussion between you and i but how can we how can we work to expand our network of potential partners and some tactics. Oh man, I've had this exact conversation, but with like the community angle in the past where it's like, I used to say the community industry feels like it's community people yelling at community people about the importance of community. It's like, well, yeah, no shit, right? Like that, if you're just yelling at people who already get it. And I think there's a lot of that where it's like, you get this echo chamber, right? Of like, if, if whether it's sales people or partner people or community, whatever label or package you want to put on the group you're in, if you only listen to other people who are in that group, you're only going to hear one side of the story, one side of the perspective. And especially, right, sales is already like a valuable asset in some organizations. Product is already a valuable asset in some organizations. Community, partnerships, all these sort of like newer, you know, on, in the grand scheme of things, motions, they are, for the most part, second-class citizens inside the organizations, right? They're the first ones to get laid off when layoffs come. They're the last ones to get budget. They're the smallest teams are always the scrappiest teams. And if you're only talking to other partner people, you're never going to like prove the value. You're never going to understand how to interface with a sales team or interface with the marketing team or interface with an executive team. And in a way, like their opinions are more important. Like another partner person at another company isn't going to be the reason why your partnerships program gets more funding or gets the tool it needs or gets whatever, you know, resources it needs internally to be successful. It's going to be the other people at the organization understanding partnerships and you understanding how it fits in to their part of the organization for those things to happen. And it's just, I've seen this, like, it's one thing, not whether it's partnerships or community or anything. It's like, it's always easier to talk to people like yourself, but it's usually less valuable in the long term. Yes. And I think it goes back to the comfort level. It's like, I know partnerships and I feel comfortable. And I think a lot of partner people and I, you know, I don't know if there's a way to track this or, you know, Google trends this, but it's like as partnership teams get closer and closer to being dismantled and laid off, the more people on LinkedIn are trying to pull their partner peers to their, their stuff and trying to network more. And it's, yeah, it's a job safety thing. I think part of it. Um, so it's, you know, if you do spend your time networking with these teams and individuals on those teams that you aren't going to be working for next year, you feel like you're wasting your time in a sense, even though you could be getting partners pulled in. 
I think it's a tough situation is the is the issue. It's a really tough situation. I think we all know like, yeah, I really need to be networking with those individuals at the companies that I want to partner with. Um, but I'm not going to be able to get a job over there. I don't think that's going to be somewhere I'd work in a year. And I know my job half-life as a partner leader is about probably 18 months, something like that, if you, if you had to ballpark it. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a tough situation. And I think this this goes into, and I want to hear your opinion on, you know, why CEOs and obviously CROs, but uh, why leadership just love a salesperson that's grinding because it's like, I put you in that chair and you, you you either make me money in three months or you don't. And if you don't, I put someone else in that chair with partnerships is very much a lot of, a lot of like promises and a lot of like words and slides and not a lot of like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Very it's long-term. It's not like you don't see the instant payout. Exactly. But it's, I think there's, I have my like nice answer to that. And I have my like maybe slightly more aggressive answer to that. The I have the nice point answer. Of view. Give us the contrary. The nice answer is, is it's like short term, right? Sales is like you said, you sink or swim within three months. It's easy. It's measurable. It's like everyone understands it. There's standard playbooks to follow especially in economic downturn, everyone's like, how am I going to make more money this quarter? Not over the next year. And whether it's partnerships or network building or community, they tend to be longer term strategies. Um, and unfortunately, we live in an era where most companies live and die by their quarter over quarter strategy, not their one year, two year, five year strategy. I think so many people have lost sight of the three and five year vision and they're just focused on like, I got to hit 10%, I got to hit 20%, I got to hit 30% this quarter that they create the very scenario in which they're not going to hit their goals over enough time. Um, and the more maybe like controversial opinion, I've spoken to a lot of sales leaders and a lot of CEOs about this and a lot of founders. And a lot of them are old school is I think the best way to put it. They, they come from a world where 10 years ago, you raised some money, you built at least a decent product because realistically, a lot of products get paper overed by good sales teams and they're like, okay products. That doesn't work so much today, but definitely did five years ago or 10 years ago. And they just like, they build a sales force and they hit the phones and, and it works. And they've, they've known that system for so long. These people, especially CROs and VPs of sales, they have built a 20 year career on a system that hasn't really changed that much. Yes, some more tech has come into it and whatnot. Like, Yes, you can make more cold calls now. Yes, AI will help you. But like the foundational building blocks of how software is sold hasn't really changed in the dawn of the internet ever. Um, so I think subconsciously or not, they are threatened by anything that is a different system. So if you're coming and saying, hey, go to network or nearbound or people first or partnerships is a better way to sell, it's really hard for them to admit in their own heads that the system that they have known and loved and succeeded with might not be the system that's going to work for the next 10 years. Oh, yeah. And it's tough out there for these guys. And I feel for them. And we try to do anything we can to support your partnerships team and um, and give you what you need, which is why we do this podcast and invite people like Mac on to really tell you the hard truth about partnerships. So it's similar to where uh, analogous to, I'd say, where uh, content marketing was like in 2010. Um, if you're a marketer listening to this, you may have heard terms like content is king. And it was like a rally cry for leadership to understand, like, if you want to win um, out there in the World Wide Web, you've got to create a lot of content. And the SEO side of that is the the net one of the net benefits but, um, you know, these these CEOs that were from the old sales systems and, you know, pre Google and all this stuff, they didn't understand that it takes six months to start ranking and you don't yield benefits immediately from the content that you create. And it, it really has to sit out there similar to that in a situation where partnerships is um, and it's tough to prove it. And of course, they want a, a number on your head as soon as you sit down yep. and you're negotiating with your partnership leader or your CRO or CEO as soon as you're in that seat with what's the number, how long do I have? 
And then, of course, if you do partnerships correctly, you are seeding the ground and, you know, you're cultivating and farming and doing all that stuff. And it would take a year to do it actually correctly, which no CEO is going to sit there and say, um, OK, to you having. I mean, the good CEOs will say OK to that. <laughs> if we want to get like a little bit like controversial, like if you're not thinking a year out and you're only focusing on this quarter, like I said, you're already a shit CEO. Like just frankly, truly, you shouldn't have a job when you hear that. That's the hard truth. Simple yeah. as that. It's it's one you're a CEO, I'm a CEO. It's one of those things where I mean, thankfully we, you know, we drink the Kool-Aid and we understand this, but <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, just objectively putting yourself in the shoes of a CEO that's out there trying to you know, get a company to profit and manage all the expectations and all the stuff. And they have a sales department. And this is where this conversation is going. They have a sales department and they have a partnerships department um, or they had a sales department typically first. And that department is working well. And that's why they're able to hire a partnerships department. And they've got third parties wanting to partner and they say, okay, well, I need someone to manage all this stuff and grow it. And then they bring in that first partnerships person and they say, okay, well, you know, deal with these conversations, but put together a plan and put together numbers and tracking and, uh, and all that stuff and come back to me in two weeks and present to us and the board what your plan is. And that I've seen those and I've helped create those. <laughs> and, um, and that's where you get into the weeds with partnerships. But I think the bigger conversation that you and I can have today is like, okay, well, what about that system and that sort of progression from product led to add on sales and marketing, or marketing first typically, but add on sales at some point, progress to partnerships, try working with third parties. They butt heads with sales all day long, run into wall, run into wall, run into wall. And typically what happens for probably half of the teams that do it this way is, okay, rip out partnerships, maybe bring it back later or try another partner leader. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's, it's, yeah. it's broken. It, it's not working. It's not working. I think you agree with that, right? It's not working. Yeah. I, I think a lot of things in the SaaS world and sales world and go to market world aren't working. I mean, that's, that's the entire rallying cry. I think a lot of us are uh, <laughs> sitting around right now. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go. Let's let's, uh, let's dissect it a little bit. Okay. First thing is the strategy. Well, the timeline or not even timeline, the progression of teams within, within uh, your, uh, your company, the teams that you hire at what stage. So do this for me. Um, Lean forward or lean to the side? Yeah, yeah no, it's I'm trying to get to like it's classic, funny. right? You get the fancy webcam and then it there it is. Oh, there we go. There we go. You know what it is, and this is why Shoot. you see my background here. How I have like a dark green back. Like I never wear yeah. a green grass shirt. I think what the problem is, if I have to say so, the painting behind you. It's a gorgeous painting, but you it are. It's, it's it's so light. It looks like it should be the subject. So the camera wants to focus on that. It's I said, if I just move out of the way, this is probably a more interesting view, anyways. <laughs> gorgeous painting. I love the painting, but I think the real problem is you are a nice Danish uh descent gentleman um with <laughs> with Scandinavian skin. And uh, I think you yeah. either need to get a lot tanner or <laughs> you need to change your painting. <laughs> I'll just go get a spray tan before each podcast recording in the future. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, I want to talk about the painting. We can do that another time. But um, anyway, so uh, the question back to you, Mac, was um around. Let's let's do this. Let's let's do something kind of fun. I think it's fun. Um, let's try to spitball a uh, a go to market for a SaaS startup. Um, you know, doesn't matter industry. Let's just say, like, just to keep it easy. Um, you know, they're a mar they're a martech platform or a sales tech platform, right? And uh, they're going to market today. They've raised some money and uh, it's it's a founding group. They've got engineers, uh, they've got CEO and a co-founder and um, they've got uh, two years of burn and they need to ramp this stuff up and prove that they can be successful. 
And uh, they're a perfect fit to go to market through the channel, through uh, quote unquote, the channel, which is, let's say, solutions providers, your typical HubSpot agencies, maybe Shopify agencies, if they're in e-commerce. And um, they know that. And they've got the money to hire team members. Where do you start? And um, what would, well, you are in this boat right now, but what would, what would you do? advise what would you do if you were that uh that team and what would be the progression I, mean, I think of that but regardless of what regardless of what you're going to market strategy i think i mean we made this mistake early comp service like i know this from first-hand experience people think that right like the ceo or the founder goes okay i think x is a good go-to-market strategy for us content or partnerships or direct sales or whatever it is and they jump too quickly to hiring a vp of sales a vp of partnerships a vp of content marketing whatever it is or just they're like cool, come do it for us. It's like, there is zero foundational work in place to prove that that thesis and that channel is the right channel has been done. So when I, again, we did that. We hired a VP of sales who hired, you know, the six, the SR manager who hired six SDRs. We did the whole classic like sales in a box play and it, it, it failed miserably for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but so I would, to start, I wouldn't hire someone. I would, I mean, I would do it myself as the founder or as the founding team. Like if you can do it, you know, two or three or four times, once you have like an inkling, like, okay, I think this can be repeatable. Because like the mistake we made when we hired the sales leader was, and we had a VP of partnerships too that lasted four months. I was like, we just weren't ready because there was zero foundational work. People expect these hires to come in and just like silver bullet, like click a button and like, boom, partner program in a box, boom, sales team in a box, boom, community team in a box. And it's just like, doesn't work, which is ironic because on the community side, we did exactly this. I built our community to start. And then like eventually other people helped. And then we hired a head of community and then we became a community team. And then it like layered from there. I think two people try to go from zero to one by like starting at one and working backwards instead of going from zero to 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. And at a certain point, you got to hire a team, you got to scale it, you got to, you've proven it's working, go from there. But like, if you can't tell the partner hire that that's coming in, why partners should be good or what you've done so far that's worked and where they can like pick up the ball and keep running with it. You're too early to start building emotion like that. And is that is my belief. 100% agree. 100% agree. I'll tell you uh, my, my story too. And, and I think no one on this podcast has heard this, but um, I'm, I'm very much of the opinion that we as an organization can do what we're trying to do without a sales team. Right. We, we want to live and breathe this sort of like, everybody's doing partnerships, right? Um, but I hired a very expensive product lead early on and uh, spent a lot of money on that. And um, again, very much like we need to show the world that we are product focused. I'm not going to hire two AEs for the price of one product lead. I'm going to hire this product lead. And um, yes, same same idea, just different um, or same, um, same pitfall, just different uh, role. But um, a situation where it was like, okay, we need to figure this out on our own. So we're in the same boat of like, okay, we 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 need to figure this out on our own, and we need to create essentially what is the the culture almost culture is probably not the right word, but almost like what is the you know what is the function and the 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 thing and 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 the i think uh, the culture was actually a good point i think whereas like if you start as the founding team doing it yourself once again whether it's partners or community or whatever it is it's going to be a lot easier for that to be embedded in the culture i think a lot of times these like additional go-to-market motions like once again partnerships to do everyone whatever piece you want to throw in there it often gets added on after the fact and it struggles to mature beyond this like add-on. Like it's like, here's our go-to-market team. Then it's like, and there's a partner team and there's a community team. It's like, but if you start with it yourself and you as the founding team are figuring it out, it will be baked into your strategy, your culture, your ethos from day one, which means one, it's more likely to be successful. There's like a little bit of self-fulfilling prophecy to that. Uh, two, you're going to attract a better hire for that role because they're going to be like, oh shit, this is a place that values partnerships, that values communities, that values content. Like they get it. They're not just trying to like look for a quick win or like they're not just trying to augment their failing sales team, whatever it is. So it's going to be easier to hire the right person and it'll be easier to keep it going because it's baked into your strategy from day one. Oh, I love that. I love that. And um, I, get, I think a good... Um, honest truth about the whole thing is 
it's called a partner manager for a reason. You need to wait until you have partners to bring in that person. Same with why it's a community manager, right? The role isn't called community builder from zero to one. It's like, where, like there has to, like, and there are people, like, I know people that have hired community managers that have launched a community from zero to one. It does work well. Again, it's, it's not to say it's not possible, but I do think you're kind of swimming upstream if you don't bake it into the strategy yourself. I I 100% agree. So we're talking to um, your partnership teams out there, your partnership leaders, but mainly the CEOs. I think on this podcast, and even the heads of sales and and, and those that are that are that are interested in SaaS go to market, uh, the process and the timeline and when and and where and how to hire a partner team um, or bring in a partner team. And what we've kind of figured out here is it's it cannot be a bolt on. It cannot be uh, add gas, you know, to the flame. It has to be looked at in the same lens of customer success. And I think I have some article, if you look at the newsletter about this, where it's like, you have to first have that. And then you have enough of that to warrant hiring someone to manage all of it or a few people to manage all of it. And, um, and they're, they're managing the needs and the expectations of the partners, just like a customer success person would manage the customers. And uh, and in that world, okay, let's talk about the revenue number. If I hire you, Mac, to manage my partners, our partners, and you're coming onto the team, why is there a quota in that? Do you give your customer success manager a quota? Let's talk about that. And we all, of course, any CEO. I think I think some, some teams do. I've seen an increasing number of teams give their customer success teams quotas on like retention and renewals retention. and upsells. They give retention. So like, and yeah, I think it's more they give spiffs, but you're you're right. I, I'd say there they, are. They, well, they do give some sort of quota-esque style. There's a thing. KPI. There's some KPIs yeah. in there. And yes, if you have a customer success manager that's just dropping deals all or dropping um, customers and pissing people off, it's a different thing. I mean, it may also be because your product sucks and no, the best customer success team in the world is not going to save that. But no, no one wants to admit that. So <laughs> or it's like, why does no one want to partner with me? Because your product fucking sucks. Like, Okay, let's talk about that since you brought it up. That was going to be my next <laughs> transition. This, but uh, to put well, a no one wants to admit it, but <laughs> put a pin in the the CS versus partnership conversation. I think just the the main takeaway there is just be very honest about what that person is doing, and if they are going to be looking at partners as a just a referral engine, and you're just there to elicit referrals from partners. Maybe it's not a partner manager uh, as a position. Maybe it is some sort of a I sales. On that one, is I think people have to be partners. Like your team has to be partners internally before they can be partners externally. In the sense that like they have to be, once again, part of the go-to-market strategy. They have to be part of the team. They can't be this bolt-on. And I think so many people expect them to be like, hey, Alex, I've hired you my partner manager. Go find revenue now. And they expect that to paper over a broken sales team or a broken product or whatever. And they're like, they've read an article from you saying partnerships are great. Here's the data. And it's like, yeah, it's true. Partnerships are great if you have a reason to do partnerships. Because that's the other thing people don't talk about, right? Same thing with community. Everyone's like, oh, everyone is saying community-led growth is good. Therefore, I need a community. But it's like, but do you? Like, you should actually, like, you have to really get down to that bare metal of like, do you have a product worth partnering with? Do you have a strategy worth partnering with? Do you have a team worth partnering with? Okay, great. Now we can build a successful partner program. And that's why I think you said the half-life, right? If so many partner teams are like 12 months, 18 months, because it's like, you, you can't, like that, that was like when we hired a partner person, we hired a full-time partner person. They lasted four months because they literally came to me after four months. They were like, Mac, you're not ready for a partner program. Like I, I could be mildly successful here, but like, you're not going to get what you want. I'm not going to get what I want. This doesn't make sense. Which, you know, in the moment I would be like, I remember being kind of like pissed off at that conversation. Like, what the fuck do you mean? Of course, we're ready for a partner program. Because like, as a CEO, you kind of like, there's an element of like not lying to yourself, but there's like the rose tinted glasses you have to kind of like put on to like get through the day sometimes. Um, but in hindsight, she was absolutely right. We were not ready. We were like, oh, partners is a good idea. Partners plus community, thumbs up. Everyone will be happy. And it's like, 
it's just kind of a load of shit, honestly. <laughs> and I, I think in your, your, you were in a, a good position. Thankfully, you had a very mature person that came to you like, this is not going to work. I think what happens um, in most companies is that that conversation would be changed to your partner manager is just running into walls, but not wanting to lose their job. And you yeah. see them running into walls. And then what a typical CEO, I'd say what I see most hap- uh, most uh, most often is the CEO will go to that person and say, whatever you're doing is not working. What I want you to do now is go backwards to these subset of whoever and get deals from them and bring sponsorship revenue in. And they essentially get morphed into a sales person. Yeah. And then what happens, which is catastrophic, is they turn their partners into sales leads and they burn bridges all day long because yeah. hey, but for one quarter, the numbers go up, so it looks good for that quarter. But they're it, you just destroyed the plant. It's like if you ever yeah. if you ever raise plants, like a plant will get big, and if you trim it down too much, it doesn't have enough leaf space to absorb enough light to live it's kind of like that. that's a good analogy like that plant you have next to you yeah, you, know? you said oh you said earlier it's like tending a garden or a farm right it's like you have to or it's like i always love the analogy of like farmers have to rotate their crops every few years like you just keep planting the same crop in the same field season after season you just that field won't return anything after three or four seasons Exactly. You over cultivate and you ruin that yeah. partnership. And if you're the one, <laughs> I love a conversation I was on LinkedIn where, where I was talking about co-selling and I want to talk to you about co-selling a little bit. Um, but uh, they said, uh, you know, it was a, it was a story about end of quarter and there's a lead in someone's pipeline that they saw in a co-selling tool um, reveal. I think that this other partner had a, had a contact there and it was Friday afternoon. They had to push the deal through. And it wasn't even like it wasn't even like a case study. It was like, oh, why aren't you doing this? And you call up Mac Friday afternoon and say, Mac, so and so is in your pipeline as a deal. I'm trying to get them to sign on the and uh I have until 6 p.m. Can you just back channel something with me right now? And I'm like, if that's the way you're looking at co-selling and working with your partners, you are going to burn all of your partner bridges. You might get that one deal that one time, but you're not getting the next one. Yeah. And chances are they're going to, uh, the the comment on the thread was, I'm going to internet break up with you if you ever do that to me. <laughs> right? and, and I get this done yeah. and let's do, let's talk, let's, let's talk about the truth of co-selling here for the next five minutes. And, um, and I want your opinion on this, but it's like this, it's like, okay, well, there's tons of ways to get data on customers. There's intent data, there's there's first party, zero party, all this data. And you have it all as a sales organization or a partnership organization. You probably have a lot of this data. And then you tack on, okay, well, that data is connected to another person or partner or org. And now I have another line item of data. And I want to talk about the truth of like, what does, how how much closer does that really get you to the sale? to have that extra line item of data. Honestly, and you're building the product to get you even closer to the sale. So you're thinking about this all day long, but like, what is up with CoSell? What is up with it? I mean, like the, the scenario you described, I wouldn't call that CoSell. I think that's one of the problems to start, right? That's me asking you to help me close the deal. That's not CoSelling. That's just me asking you for a favor. I think people have mistaken like favor asking for partnering, basically. Um, and it's like, yeah, like where I work, like, listen, like, like if you get to know someone, you know them really well, they're a friend. Like, like I helped someone close a deal the other day because like they actually were selling to someone who's like one of my best childhood friends, which is like total random coincidence. But I was like, yeah, I can call him and like put him in. Cause like, I really, I know you really well. I know him really well. That's fine. Um, but that's like pretty rare that those stars align that perfectly that just asking for a favor works. Um, I mean, like true co-selling in reality, and it's funny, it's like, I don't think I see any SaaS companies actually doing this, which is interesting. But true co-selling would be like, I want to sell A, you want to sell B. How do we sell A and B together? That's what actual, like, if you like, that's what actual co-selling would be. But that's not what that definition has been, you know, has been co-opted to mean, I think, in the partner world. Um, and I don't, I don't actually know 
how that'll work out because I don't think a lot of people do it. So I don't think there's actually that much data on it. I mean, there is some of like, like the agency model, but that's not like, that's not really co-selling. That's like an agency selling on your behalf because like, you know, like HubSpot, like they're going to come in and install the software. So of course you're going to get HubSpot or, you know, if someone's buying HubSpot, like, oh, I need an agency to set it up. Like that's about as close to real co-selling as I think things get right now. But I don't think I've seen many great examples of two SaaS companies co-signing there. I've seen the SaaS and agency one work well. And I know that's like your world and specialty. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just think people like to throw that word around. But I don't think people actually like have paused and thought about like, what would a SaaS company co-selling motion actually look like? I don't, I don't I haven't seen an example of it. Yeah. And I have to, you know, I have to give a shout out to, you know, the products, of course, your reveals, your cross beams, you know, there's, they're doing their thing. And, and, um, but they're I, not co-selling tools, they're data tools. They're, and that's like, it's important. So different. <laughs> it's important. It's, a, and, and it, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot too. Obviously we're building partner hub and we have a product, um, that, uh, that is supposed to help these partner teams get closer to the deals. But I think in, in reality, it's a situation where, it, you you said it uh, the way I would kind of reinterpret a couple things that you said is like, you know, the A and the B, you've got two customers and I've got the A, you've got the B. The, the, the real thing that we should be doing is saying, okay, well, how do we move A and B together? And uh, how do we, how do we influence those deals together? And I think where it becomes a problem is like when you put the word sale or sell into that definition, and then you say, okay, well, I'm going to buy a tool that influences sell. Then it's, okay, that's a sales organization's tool. And now your marketing team is over here using ABM software and uh, content marketing engines and all this stuff. And then your sales team is siloed in this tool and they've got all this data. And it's like, I see Max in your pipeline not here and he's not in my pipeline. I want to bring him over and I need your help. And it's just salesperson talking to a salesperson about who can do what with that deal. And if we're honest about uh, as salespeople, I've been a salesperson. Do I really have any influence over that customer? No. They yeah, also like if you're if you're about to close someone and I go, hey, you have, you're like, no, I'm not going to waste. I'm trying to close them for myself right now. Like I'm not going to burn that deal for you. Like what the hell? Are you like, hey, eighty percent of us aren't going to make quota this quarter. Like I'm, I'm like, let's be honest. Like. No one wants to have the selfish conversation because it's like, especially on LinkedIn, everyone's like, oh, everything's happy. Everyone's like, you know, one big happy sales and partner family. And like, first of all, like, bullshit. When the money gets down to the wire, like people are going to do what's best for them. Like, like that's just human nature. Like even the best people in the world, even the nicest, most collaborative partner people in the world, if I'm going to like risk a deal to help you, I'm not going to do that, right? Like it's going to be like, maybe I've already closed the deal. I've known them for a while. Like, sure, I can like put in a good word for you or something, but like, I'm not risking a deal that's going to define if I hit my quota this quarter or not to help you potentially maybe open a deal. Like, and I think that's why the partnership has to happen so much sooner than before that moment. It's not like, Hey, we're both trying to close a deal. We're at like the 90% line. Let's close together. It has to happen at like the 0% line. So okay. you influence and work together. It's not a, it's not a final 10 yards, like hail Mary pass type thing. Like, like, like it's not your six o'clock Friday afternoon call, as you mentioned. Exactly. Exactly. So if we were to give you some tactical advice related to how to use the data that is technically co-sales and co-selling provided, um, who knows who at what organization, the advice that I would give is, like Mac mentioned here, is you have to start early and you have to look at it like it's not your piece of your pie that I'm trying to get and you try to get a piece of my pie. It's how can we build a well, bake a pie together and we share that pie, right? So don't yeah, look at it like- It's not me asking you. To, it's not, I'm not trying to borrow a piece of your pie. Exactly, exactly. I, I, If you go to me and you say, also, Alex- Because humans are bad. Humans I'm don't like sharing. sharing. Even the ones who say they like sharing, it's like inherently not. When it comes down to like, if I'm going to get my bread or you're going to eat your bread, most people, and they don't want to admit it because it's, but that's the truth. People are going to pick their own bread. Exactly. Um, bartering the days of bartering, you know, unfortunately are, are, are long gone, but either way, it's, it's a scenario where the sales software is siloed to sales, marketing, 
may, if you have a good organization, hopefully marketing and sales are working together on that data. But it comes back to the point of like, <laughs> hopefully, but not the, not the case in most organizations. Most of the organizations, <laughs> they don't. And it's unfortunate. So I tell the partner managers this it, related to co-selling is, you know, you have to look at it as brass tacks. It is a a starting point. You map accounts. And I know five people that are customers that you know as well. That's our starting point. Now let's figure out using all of the tools and ammunition and, and things that we do as organizations and people, how do we get that number to double in the next month? And it doesn't mean just calling those five people and saying, do you have a referral for me? Or can you jump into my pipeline or whatever? It means uh, doing the work of who are we both going to market with yeah. and, or or for and where are those people and how do we get embedded in those together? And that's where co-selling originally started with software on the ground, boots on the ground, selling a computer to an individual or a business and then bringing the software and bringing the, the printer and the add-ons and you're selling your printer and I'm selling the, the hard drive and we need somebody that sells the screen and we're going to go door to door. That's where it started. And it's just gotten to this yeah. point where it, all it is, is just more data, which is hard for anyone. Well, I think it's like, it's too much. I think we have all been blinded by data and numbers and I had a great conversation. This is like sort of tangential, but like I had a great conversation with a seller the other week who was talking about how they close most of their deals from... Uh, going to events, like not even like conferences, just like going to local hangouts with their ICPs or social selling and stuff like that. But their sales leader is like cold calls, cold emails, cold calls, cold emails, cold calls, cold emails, because those are the things, those are the activities that can be trackable. And I think we've been so blinded by our drive for data and things, every little thing having to be measurable or automated or whatever, that we've lost sight of like the human side of selling and partnerships and so like when you say like, what do you do with the data? Like I see that you have a, a customer you're trying to sell to that I'm also trying to sell to. I shouldn't, that data does not mean go trigger an automation, go trigger a phone call, go like auto add them to your pipeline, whatever. That should trigger a human interaction between you and me figuring out how we can both win, right? And I think it's like people like, obviously like it's easy to say that. And everyone says that conceptually, I think when they talk about partnerships and co-selling. But I think as, we, as we've talked about, the data blinds us from doing the human thing because we end up doing like, I'll just do the more scalable thing. And ironically, in my experience, a lot of people disagree with me on this. I have had a lot of conversations where just like, Matt, you're just, I like people be like, young man, you have no idea how the world works. I'm like, All right, I'm not, I'm like, I'm not that young, come on. Um, but like, I, I, I think that like the benefits come almost when you like, not like forget about the data, but like the data should almost be like, secondary it's like a canary in a coal mine type thing it itself is not the coal you're trying to mine it's just the canary i love that yeah but that scares people because people are terrified of not having perfectly measurable predictable things. they spent a lot of money on it too it's like okay now you're telling me that all this data that i'm buying you as the cro or whatever uh you need to go back to the the origins of sales and and hit up these events is what you're telling me and or yeah. just like cold call, like all these people. I think the worst thing that ever happened to sales and partnership and go to market is that everyone's data just became available to click of a button. I mean, privacy and ethical side aside, it just destroyed the actual art of selling. We were able to paper over it by just hitting the numbers hard. And I think as we've all noticed in the last year and a half, oops, that doesn't work forever. That is not a permanent up into the right line. Like who would have thought? It's like, with this 10 year magic bubble of just like, if you had enough money, if you bought the right software, you built a mediocre product, selling was fucking easy, right? Like within, I mean, it's not like it was easy, easy, but three years ago compared to today, it was like, you know, I know sellers that just like showed up and picked up the phone at the right time and like got a million dollar commissions on deals. Like I, that doesn't happen today. That, that world is done. That world's over. That world will probably never come back based on the way things are trending. Not like, not to that degree, I don't think. So I think there has to be this element of like, just really putting the human authenticity back into it. I think also like with automation and AI, that's only become more true, right? Everyone's like, I saw a post the other day where someone was bragging about booking like 60 meetings in two months with their like SDRs. It's like, great, that sounds really impressive when you look at just that number. 
But on their own screenshot of the data, they had to cold call almost 1,300 unique leads to book 60 meetings. And like all the comments are like, oh, this is incredible. Like, look, well, cold calling still works. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills because I look at that. I'm like, how the, how the hell do we think that is like a reflection of something working? Like I have to call and piss off over a thousand people to book 60 meetings, which by the way, on average, only 20% of book meetings end up closing. So like, I was about to say, it's not even the deals. It's not even the, like, well, the show rate. deals. Yeah. The show yeah, rate, like 60 meetings, 50%. let's say half of those show and 10 of those become deals. Like, but we've like convinced ourselves that the numbers are good and it's like the ends justify the means. And I, I just don't think they do. Not anymore. I mean, like I, I can't even get a cold call right now. Like you cannot, call, you can't cold call. My phone doesn't ring if I don't know your number. It's physically impossible to cold call. And everyone will like people, I, I had someone tell me that I'm not doing my job if I'm not accepting cold calls, which I thought was insane. Not to like go on the cold call ramp, but like, I guess the point I'm trying to say is I think a lot of partner teams have struggled, a lot of community teams, a lot of partner teams, a lot of co-selling motion because they're trying to model themselves like a sales team. They're trying to have the same data tools, the same automation tools, the same like quick win basically that sales teams have kind of gotten used to over the last 10 years. But the very thing that makes partners and community and co-selling and all these sort of things and brand, things that make them unique and powerful are not hidden in your data. They are act like they they are powerful because they're not the way sales teams sell. And I think people have forgotten that. I know people have forgotten that. And that's important. I think that's yeah. a good place to end. I'll just say, uh, in summary, you know, we need to go back to what works. I think we're overloaded with data. And if you spend your time looking at those dashboards all day long and trying to figure it out, you're gonna lose sight of what really works with sales and partnerships. And then uh, the cultural element that we talked on uh, why partnerships needs to be a part of everything you do is important. And looking at it as truly, it's not about hiring a team to go in and see where the data exists and who knows who. It's really about figuring out who you can bake a new pie with, bake that pie, share that pie, and then go bake another pie with another entity or another group or another individual and um, and continue that process. And a lot of it is in person. A lot of it is going back to the the grassroots of of building, you know, building sales engines or building um, building your company. This has been awesome, Mac. Um, well, Bronto is in early access beta for any of you wanting to get involved. And that is a terrific resource to get very close to the people like uh, people are your partners get very close to the people that are working um in the same worlds as you are and uh, managing that system and um anything else mac that you want to mention before we sign off oh man you want 10 minutes no, i'm kidding there's a lot of things but no i think uh no i think i said i think i said everything i want to say um appreciate the bronto shout out i mean if you like dinosaurs you like selling in a modern way Come say hi. I don't bite. The dinosaur might, but I don't. <laughs> Brontosauruses are, are uh, they're, they're vegetarian. I mean, they might crush you accidentally. They won't eat you on purpose, but they might not see you and step on you. So <laughs> you have to be careful. <laughs> I love it. All right, Mac. Well, we'll see you on the interwebs. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Mac Redden, everybody.